lot of Eric's presenting uh, this weekend uh, or this week, and I guess I'm the first. Uh, my name is Eric Stack, and I am, I'm from Duke University, uh, the Department of Mechanical Engineering and Material Science. Um, this is my first uh, GDEVCon. Um, I know maybe like five or six people here, um, so I'll try to come around and, and meet people. So come, come say hi. Um, and uh, you know, excited, excited to be here. Um, so just kind of a quick uh, a bit about me. Um, I am a, a, a Duke graduate. Also, one thing is I tend to sort of like walk around and fidget around on the stage. So like if I block something, especially for y'all up front, just, just tell me to move. Um, I'll try not to block the stage too much. Um, so I'm a graduate of Duke uh, 2014, um, degree in mechanical engineering. Um, and actually fresh out of school, um, I interviewed it at NI. Um, it was a cool experience. I had to go out to Austin, um, meet uh, Dr. T, Jeff K was there. Uh, they rejected me, sadly. Um, I did, really didn't know anything, like I didn't know LabVIEW or anything. Um, I was pretty clueless. I mean, I'm still pretty clueless about a lot of things, but it was especially then. Um, um, but it ended up working out for the best um, because I got to, in 2016, go back to my alma mater, go back to Duke, um, and start working as a, a research and development engineer there, um, which is what I'm doing right now. Um, and I work in the uh, mechanical engineering teaching labs, um, so I work with undergrads a lot, and we uh, design and develop uh, teaching lab experiments for our uh, program. Um, everything from control systems to thermodynamics, fluid mechanics, heat and mass transfer. Um, so we get to design and build test setups. Um, and a lot of that involves collecting data. Um, so that's where I, I picked up LabVIEW. So we get to use LabVIEW um, for, for all of our data acquisition, our, our control applications. Um, we use like NI stuff in all the labs. So um, that's kind of where my, my passion for developing LabVIEW uh, came from. And uh, not, on the, not on the slide, but um, I am a big Harry Potter fan. Uh, so I just, Quinn, I just wanted to point out I am wearing Harry Potter socks right now. Um, <laughs> we show, um, they have the Hogwarts houses on them. Um, I'm trying to put some magic into the presentation, that's, that's why. What house uh, are you? I'm, I'm a Hufflepuff, and it took me a long time to accept that. Um, I, like, I took the test over and over and over, and I was like, ah, oh, but then I just, I accepted it, and it's, I'm a Hufflepuff and I'm proud. Um, thank you, Woo person. Um, and uh, a couple of fun things that I've gotten to do. Uh, I got to talk at NI Week uh, 2019, uh, and obviously now at, at GDevCon uh, 2013, uh, 2023. And uh, a, a kind of a, a cool thing happened. Uh, in 2017, I had been exchanging emails with, with an NI applications engineer because I was having some issue and, and I figured it out and I wrote back and I was like, hey, these are all the things I did. Um, and I don't know if you can read the, the email, I'm probably standing right in front of it. Um, but she called me the best kind of customer and was like, oh, we'll pass these steps along. Um, so to that I say, take that NI. Um, <laughs> Kidding, you, you, you know I love you. Um, but yeah, that was kind of a, a fun thing. Um, so before I get started, you know, there's kind of a few questions that I just kind of want everyone to sort of ponder about and, and think about as I go through this. Um, do you remember the, the first LabVIEW VI you wrote? Like before you were certified developers and architects and experts, you know, the, the first VI you wrote, the first LabVIEW problem you solved? I hear, I hear some, some yeses out there. Um, yeah, for me, it was, a, it was a string gauge application. I was learning string gauges. Um, and I also had a, a LabVIEW runtime error that I, that I had to solve. Um, another thing is some, some challenging project that you've, you've encountered um, that, that seemed overwhelming. You didn't really know where to start, um, whether it was something you experienced you know, as a young engineer or something you know, just, just yesterday, the other day. Um, so you know, kind of have, have that in the back of your mind. And, and also, just kind of a show of hands, like who works with young engineers and who works with young developers and a lot of teaching? Yeah, so it's pretty much, pretty much everybody. Um, so, so this presentation, I, I tried to sort of put, you know, kind of from that, that point of view of, of someone who's kind of doing something for the first time and, and, you know, maybe they're not an expert on a certain topic. Um, so these are kind of things that I kind of, you know, want everyone to just sort of have the back of their mind during this. Um, so you know, I work in the teaching lab, so it, as, I wonder if, if anyone has had a conversation that, that goes something like this. Um, and, and person A says, help, my circuit doesn't work. And I'm using a, a circuit in this example. Um, person B says, well, what's, what's the problem? Person A says, well, I hooked everything up and it, and it didn't work. Um, 
person B says, well, there, there could be a lot of things. You like, are you getting power? Is, is the wiring correct? Is the wiring correct, but there's a bad connection? Um, is, is it a code problem? I don't know. Uh, person A responds, my board's broken. I want a new one. Oh, okay, like it could be the board, like it, but there are a lot of other things. Um, so I, you know, may respond something like, well, PEPCAC. And for those of you who don't know what that means, the problem exists between the keyboard and chair, user error. Um, I'm also a big Taylor Swift fan, so I really just wanted to use a, a, a Taylor Swift meme in, in this presentation. Um, but this is like an actual conversation, like I've actually had. Um, and and who, has anyone ever been person A in this scenario? Because I definitely have. Um, you're saying, oh, it's it's got to be the, it's got, wait, no, oh, wait, it's, it's me, I'm the problem. Um, so, uh, sort of the motivation behind this, this presentation, I, I kind of alluded to it earlier. Um, I work with mechanical engineering undergrads. I work with undergrads a lot. Um, one of my focuses are our control systems class where we, where we do use LabVIEW. So, so we are trying to instruct LabVIEW onto the youngins, um, at, at least at Duke, um, at least in, in my classes. Um, so I, I wanted to make a presentation that was uh, through the lens of, of trying to do something new for the first time, and I chose to focus on my experience on a, a specific project, and it was an NI Vision project. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. Um, this isn't intended to be like, this is how you do everything in Vision, um, but I am hoping to sort of put some NI Vision tips um, you know, present some, some of those tips along the way. So hopefully if you do have a project, you can maybe reference some of those, those features and say like, oh, I, I didn't know I could do that or, or maybe this is a way to do that. Um, and I also tried to sort of put myself in the shoes of, of a young engineer on, on the job facing an, an unknown problem um, and still learning how to, to, to break a problem down and sort of encircle where your, where your issue is and, and try to find the root cause. Um, so the, the setup that, we, that I'm gonna be focusing on today, um, we developed a, a curling lab. So is anybody familiar with this, the sport of curling? Has anybody ever played? Yes, awesome. Um, there's actually a couple curling centers here in, in Denver. Um, I, I started playing about a year ago. I actually looked up to see if I could play some while I was here, but they're, they're closed for the summer. Um, for, for the folks who aren't familiar with curling, um, my brief 10 second overview, um, it's played on a sheet of ice about 150 feet long. Uh, there's a target down at the other end and the two teams uh, uh, slide a 40 pound rock down the ice and try to get it towards the target. And whoever's closest to the center at the end gets a point. Um, so there's a lot of strategy, a lot of collisions involved. You know, you're trying to knock your opponent's rock out of the way. Um, so for our uh, sophomore level dynamics course, um, we decided we wanted to do a lab on momentum, collision mechanics, and we wanted to do this on a frictionless surface and use the sport of curling as the example. Um, we wanted to do something fun and we've something we figured like no one else at a university had probably done um, and, and try to be a little, a little unique. Um, so we bought these, uh, frankly, adorable miniature curling stones. Um, I have a couple up here. Um, they, they claim to be, I got them off Amazon, they claim to be granite, which is the, the material used in the um, in actual curling stone. So a real curling stone is probably like the size of your head, um, a little bit bigger than that, and it weighs about 40 pounds, um, which is a little bit too big for our purposes. Um, but uh, we, we built a tabletop ice surface and uh, we wanted to try to mimic um, the techniques used by a commercial ice rink. And what they do is they take a, uh, run a sub-zero chiller, rub a, run a uh, saltwater brine through it, and then uh, embed all of that in concrete and build their ice surface on top of that. Um, we deviated a little bit. We still had, a, we, we built the copper pipe, but we sandwiched it between two plates of aluminum. So you can see our, our SolidWorks model um, on the top right. Um, and we uh, pumped a uh, ethylene glycol mixture through the pipes and then painted it white and then built our uh, ice surface on top of that. Um, so this became our, our experimental setup. Unfortunately, I, I couldn't bring it with me today. It sh ships a little far from North Carolina, but um, maybe in the winter time, you can, if we have GDEVCon in the, the winter, maybe we can do a demo next time. Um, so, 
for the data acquisition for this, um, we know we are going to have these collision scenarios with these with these rocks colliding, and we want to measure object position versus time. We ultimately want to get the instantaneous velocity, but we have to measure position to get that. Um, we considered a few sensors to start. Uh, we considered like mounting accelerometers and having like wires come up through the ceiling and or, or come up top. Um, but then I heard from from someone that oh you can use a webcam with lab view and, and I didn't really know at the time. I was like, oh I didn't know you could do that. Uh, so let's let's try this. I don't know anything about machine vision. Let's let's learn this and try it out. Um, so we, we bought a, a $30 Logitech webcam, uh, mounted it above the of uh, the ice surface with a tripod and we're going to use that to uh, collect video of the objects and get our, our position versus, versus frame data. Um, so, the sort of the project overview here is I need to develop a machine vision application that can collect video, it can uh, identify an object in the video, it can track that object through each frame of the video, and then report the object's position. Um, Going to the project, I know nothing about machine vision or image processing, and I've never used webcam in LabVIEW. Um, so I had a very simple, basic question when I started this: was where where do I start? How do I how do I get going? Um, so kind of from this point forward, what I'm going to do is I'm going to sort of say like, here was my roadblock, and then here's how I sort of overcame it and sort of the steps um, along the way. Um, so what I call is, is roadblock zero is sort of asking yourself the question, like, is this even possible? Like, what does it take to just get myself started here? Um, and I'd sort of ask myself the question, you know, does my, is my hardware going to work with, with the PC? Um, fortunately, with, with LabVIEW, connecting with external hardware is, is really easy, um, but I'm sure, as everyone knows, it's, it's not always trivial to get the hardware and, and the software to talk, and sometimes that can be a, a really frustrating stage to, to getting a project started. Um, not to name any names, but especially if you use certain PLC programs that brands that start with the name Allen, but I'm not going to name any names here. Um, but um, yeah, so this you know isn't much of a roadblock. You already sort of know going into this is um, going into this that it'd be possible. Um, but it's still a good sanity check just to make sure what you're um, asking for is possible. Um, especially if you would be asked to draw seven red lines, all strictly perpendicular, some with green ink, some with transparent ink, and one in the form of a kitten. And if you've never seen the YouTube video that that references from, um, you should definitely look that up because it's, uh, I cried watching it the first time. Um, all right, so getting started with the, with the NI Vision software, uh, there are a few tools that you'll need from the, from the NI Package Manager. Uh, one is the Vision Acquisition software, and that has all of your drivers uh, for getting, uh, talking to the cameras, reading the cameras. You have the, the iMac and the iMac MX, which I always thought was kind of confusing. I didn't really know which was which. Uh, but as I understand it, the iMac is talking with like NI Vision hardware, and then the iMac uh, MX is with your, your third party, your USB plug-in device. Um, and then you have the vision development module, which is functions for image processing and machine vision. Um, so I downloaded these, I installed these, and hooked my webcam up to lab um, um, to my PC, and open up NIMAX, and it shows up in, in, in NIMAX, which is great. Um, shows up as, as Logitech webcam. It's able to pull all this information about it, um, and. This seems like a very, very smooth process. Once you get everything installed, it just hooks up and it works. Um, so that was great. Um, and if you go at the bottom of the screen, you can sort of mess around with some of the settings, similar to if you were hooking up an NI, an NI DAC, um, or any sort of you know, Visa instrument. Um, and you can look at sort of the acquisition settings. You can select you know, how many frames per second you want. You know, is it what the pixel format is? Um, and then you can mess around with some uh, attributes, there's a frog, um, such as the brightness, the backlight compensation, the contrast. Um, and I think these are things you can all programmatically like set in the VI, um, but you can also sort of just very quickly play around with these in, in Max. Um, so at this point I'm like, all right, 
I can I can read my camera. This is pretty good. So let me check out some of these these vision functions uh, in the block diagram. So I have um, my NI uh, iMac and uh, iMac DX functions, vision utilities, image processing, machine vision. Okay. Um, let me check out these these blocks. Um, I see some fr familiar, uh, you know, an open, a close, a grab, a sequence. Um, you know, none of that seems seems too over the top here. Let me let me dig into to some of these palettes a little bit more. Uh, vision utilities. All right, um, image management. That that sounds useful. If you file. I'm gonna have to work with files. Uh, calibration. That's that's something I'm gonna want to have to do. Uh, region of interest. That that sounds useful. All right. Let me let me dig a little bit more. Uh, image processing. Um, I, I might have to do some processing. Um, analysis. I could probably have to do some analysis. Um, motion estimate, that sounds useful, motion estimation. Um, morpho I don't really know what morphology is, but that's there. Um, all right, machine vision. Um, coordinate system, I, I surely would like a coordinate system. Um, you know, measure distances, find patterns, uh, searching and matching, uh, track tracking, that seems definitely useful. Um, um, but this this is a lot of blocks to sort of figure out and sort of scope down like what 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 do I need like what's going to work for my application? All right, let me let me go to, let me go to an example. Let me open up an example and, and see if I can I can go from there. Um, all right, so I, I open the NI example finder. Um, there's some high level functions. There's some low level functions. There's a there's stream to disk. There's basic acquisition. Now, you know, let me let me open these. Uh, let me let me open one of these VIs and take a look at it. Okay. Um, there's 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 a lot that like there's a lot of comments in there. Like uh, this is going to take a little. But I think I can I can sift through and sort of figure out what's what's going on here. Um, okay. Um, yeah. So roadblock number one: the information overload stage. Um, my lesson learned here is that NI Vision can do a lot. It seems like. Um, more than I probably need, um, but I am a little bit overwhelmed by the the amount of information that was just presented to me. Um, for example, on the on the acquisition side, there's these uh, high level and low level VIs do, doing the same thing, and there's this thing called ring acquisition. Like, does does any of this matter for my application? Like, will one work? Will both work? I don't know. Um, on the processing side, there was this this motion estimation, uh, fine patterns, searching and matching. Like, what what's going to be the most uh, appropriate and sort of the simplest, most effective of way to do this? So I decide that I'm going to form formulate a game plan here and kind of break this thing down and just sort of incrementally work through this, you know, piece by piece. So my game plan is I'm going to break this application down into manageable goals, and they're each going to have sub goals. And sort of these these blocks here were, were my major goals. Um, first, I'm just going to focus on g getting an image. Can I take a still? Can I take a video? Can I save this to a file? And then I'll get into the object tracking. Can I can I load back this video that I took? Can I can I find the object? Can I can I track it? Can I scale it into the right units so that it's actually giving me proper measurements? And then can I do this multiple times? Um, and the last part, replaying it. I'm not going to really talk about that, but that's just you know, can I can I show this back to the user and give the user some some feedback? And I decided that I was going to learn each of these pieces independently, sort of in its own you know, sandbox, and just write small, simple VIs that would help me sort of accomplish these tasks so I could learn these different vision features sort of in and out before I went and I sort of built my, my, my final, my main application. And for better or for worse, I decided to not use the Vision Express VIs, um, possibly because I'm insane, but also I just kind of wanted, I kind of wanted to learn the lower level features. You know, like you ever like, I want to know how this works. Um, so I, I kind of wanted to learn how to, how to do it that way. And, and ultimately this is how like I ended up dividing up this, this main application. So there was like a main and there was like three sort of like sub VIs that each had their own role. And this is how it ended up, ended up getting uh, broken down. So to learn these features in a sandbox, um, I sought some help from our long but not forgotten friend, 
Many of you are going to call this a foe, and I'm very sorry for those of you who, who I am about to offend, but I sought help from none other than LabVIEW NXG. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I, I love LabVIEW, but, but something that, that I think is, is hard about LabVIEW and, and that I see students sort of have issues with is like if you don't know what you're looking for and you don't know where in the block diagram to look, like it can be kind of hard to get started. It can be a little bit overwhelming trying, trying to find things. So I, I, I did like sort of the extra guidance and like the more prominent context help and property displays and, and descriptions for the functions that were very like in your face, like this is what's going on. Um, I thought it facilitated the, the, the learning process a little bit. So I would sort of play around and I would sort of learn these features and then once I felt felt comfortable I was like all right now I'm going to go back to classic lab view and I'm going to I'm going to implement these as I know I know what I'm looking for um, and I know I ultimately want this to be in you know classic lab view. Um, you know one of the one of the nice things that that NXG had was it had the the system designer so when I hooked my camera up to uh, to my computer, um, you go in and it simply, you know, just displays. Oh, hey, you have this. You have this camera, and on the right side of the screen, it gives you here are all these, you know, example programs. And I don't have to do this without opening any opening Max at all. Um, it gives me a, a simple display. All right, basics, advanced. I'm going to go into the the basics menu of the examples. Um, and then it gives me various options like grab images, snap image, sequence, and I say, all right, you know, I'm going to just play around with this, this snap image uh, VI. Um, and then going on to my, you know, from here, I, I sort of opened this up and played around with that. And uh, on to my, my second roadblock, just acquiring an image. And I use this, this example VI, I'm like, I'm just going to try to grab one image and realized it's not so scary when you sort of get down to it. It's just the familiar initialize an image, read an image, close an image. Um, not, not too challenging. It's a, a pattern we're all, we're all familiar, familiar with doing our, our data acquisition. Um, but you know, I, I kind of felt like this, this interface was, was helpful in just sort of getting you know, more efficiently kind of seeing that, that you know, basic structure. Um, and, and so I, I sort of leaned on this at the beginning. Um, so I've, I've got my image. And now I'm going to say, all right. Well, now, now I want to I want to be able to take a, a video, and I want to be able to to save it. Um, so I opened up um, what I, what was called a, a ring acquisition uh, VI, and uh, as I understand it, what that does is it sort of pre-allocates an array of of images, and then it goes and it reads those images and sort of stores them in this in this buffer. Um, and then I just made a very crude. Um, Logging uh, added a very crude logging feature to it, where I, I created a um, a path to an AVI file. I took that image and I stored it um, to an AVI or saved it to the AVI, and then I closed it. Um, so I just went in and, and um, sort of modified this and gave myself a simple VI where I can just go and I can just take video, and then I can go and I can do with that whatever I want to do later. Um, so the next roadblock. So Great, I've I've got a video file. Now what what comes next? Now now sort of becomes the more more challenging part. Um, I need to ultimately get uh, my object position versus time um, so that I can go and I can calculate the velocity. So I need to know where the object is during each frame of this video. So I need a way to teach LabVIEW what object I want it to look for. And then I want it to scroll through each frame of this video and then say, all right, here's your, the object I want you to look for. Now, now look for it. Um, and after some, some searching on the, on the NI forums, um, it seemed like a, a pattern match was going to be the way to go. And this is under the machine vision sub palette. Um, so the way this would kind of work is I would give it some, some template image to look for and I would have it learn that template image. Um, and I had this kind of workflow where I would do, you know, define the object that I want you to search for and then teach LabVIEW the object, LabVIEW would learn the object, and then I would, and then I would match that, that object. Um, so defining the object, um, there's one uh, feature that I, that I found really, really useful, um, and it's this uh, construct region of interest uh, VI. 
And what this does is this uh, generates automatically generates a pop-up window uh, where you as a user can just draw a box around the thing, the object that you want to find, and then it will sort of take that, that data, it'll define it as a region of interest, and that's use, you can use that data to then feed you know, your, the rest of your, your functions. And, um, you know, because we're, we're, we're doing curling here, we're going to have collisions between multiple objects. I need to make sure this can handle potentially multiple objects. Um, one kind of neat thing about this VI is that um, when you hold down the control key, you can actually just draw multiple region of interests and, and LabVIEW is able to see that you have multiple region of interests selected. Um, so I was like, oh, well, that's, that's going to be, that's going to be pretty useful. Um, I assume there's a limit. I assume you can't do that infinitely, but I haven't really tried to stress test that. Um, but um, so, so this was kind of a nice, and, and LabVIEW just automatically brings this up. You don't have to sort of program it into it all, um, which is a really nice feature. Um, and a couple other uh, VIs, that, a couple other functions that ended up being useful um, were this uh, iMac learn pattern. I don't know why it's six. I assume that's the sixth iteration of that sub-VI. Um, uh, but what that would do is you would give it the um, image that you, that region of interest that you sort of just taught it in the previous VI, and it would, it would learn that image. Um, and then what the match pattern would do, again, I don't know why it's match pattern four, um, but what that would do is that would take your, your learned image and would also take some image that you're trying to, you know, your, your video that you're trying to find the image in, and it would take the two of those and it would try to match, basically match the, like, what it says. It's going to match the image. Um, so I, I kind of worked out my, my basic process of like, all right, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get this, define this region of interest, I'm going to get LabVIEW to learn the pattern, I'm going to match the pattern. So I want to write a VI that can just sort of, I can just manually scroll through each frame of this video that I took one by one and just sort of see if, if I can get it to, to look for this and I, if I can get it to match this, this pattern. Um, so I have a, uh, just a video here of me doing this, a very crude LabVIEW NXG front panel. Um, this is just one of my prototyping VIs. Um, so I just took a, a very quick video of me just holding the camera above the curling stone and then sort of moving the camera around a little bit. Um, so, and then um, with a the th couple of things I'm, I'm displaying, I just have some buttons to sort of do uh, the various tasks. Um, and then it's displaying, uh, whenever it finds a match, it will display some data like, what's the X, Y position of this match? What's the, the scale? What's the score of this match? Um, and that's, those are some of the, the, the data that's just displayed on there. So what I'm going to do is just um, open up, uh, run the VI, and then open up um, my image. I'll draw a box around the uh, curling stone with the construct uh, RO, um, ROI function, hit OK. And then I'm going to press this next image button, which uh, is just going to scroll through the next, one by one, scroll through the next frame of this video. Um, at the top, it just displays, that's, that's the learned image, and then the bottom one is my um, image of the video. And I'm, I'm just sort of moving it around a little bit um, on the video and then scrolling through the frames. And it is able to, to track my object. Um, one thing I, I kind of want to point out, I don't, I don't know how easy it is for, for folks to see, um, but you notice that this uh, score, that match score, it's, it's going down uh, quite a bit. It, it is still able to see the object. But as, as the lighting changes, um, it's still able to find the object, but it, it shows that it's not finding it sort of as, you know, as well. I guess a perfect score would be a thousand. Um, so it's still able to find it. Um, but, but so far, I'm pretty encouraged by this, by this progress. I'm able to define an object, and I'm able to find this object in, in each frame of, of my uh, video. Um, roadblock number four, working with multiple objects. This is great, and I'm really encouraged by this, by this, um, by the progress I've made. 
But how is this going to work with multiple objects? Once I throw two objects in there, when I put two, two stones in there, how, what's going to happen here? Um, turns out it's pretty simple. You can just throw it in a while or a for loop and it will do it. Um, so this uh, IMAC construct um, ROI function um, outputs some ROI data and somehow it's using this ungroup ROI function, it's able to take all those, like if you draw multiple ROIs, it's able to separate those into an array of region of interests, which you could then just put into a for, uh, use to index into a for loop and then learn the pattern. And that uh, will spit out um, in an array of learned images. And then on the, on the match side, you can just do the, the same thing and throw those images into, into a for loop and, and keep running your, your match function. Um, so that was pretty encouraging that, that we can do that. Um, so getting the, the individual stones. So at this point, I started to run into a few fa failure points, and I'll be honest, most of you out in the crowd have probably already figured out what the, the fix is here, um, but I'm trying to, trying to chronicle the way I work through this, so we're going to take the long way around. Um, so uh, curling stones have, have a handle on there, um, so as it collides and as it spins, um, you know, the orientation of that's going to change. Well, the way that the, the learn pattern feature works is if I tell it to look for this image, like if I tell it to look for my hand, it's going to look for that image. You or I know that if, you know, my hand moves to the side, we know it's the same image, but the computer doesn't know that. So, you know, if I tell it to look for this and I give it this, it's going to say, I, I, I don't see it. Um, so, um, yeah, I, you know, I started to run into this issue where is if once the stone sort of turned, um, it would, that match score would, would go down and it would ultimately lose it. And if it would see some other dark patch on the screen, it would think that that's my stone. Um, because it's only looking for that specific image, you know, that arrangement of pixels. Um, so I was playing around with these, with the match parameters a little bit, um, including this one option called angle ranges, um, which I believe what it'll do is it'll sort of take your, your learned image and sort of rotate it up to like 360 degrees and sort of search for that. Um, but I found pretty quickly that that was a horrendously bad idea um, because it brought the processing to kind of a screeching halt. Um, for a quick five second video that I took, it would take like two minutes to process it. I was like, well, that's not sustainable. Um, so, so I didn't really use that. So um, it brought me to sort of my, my, my next step where I was like, all right, well, let me come up with some like, you know, distinguishable identifier to put on these rocks so I can clearly identify what they are. Um, and of course, this has to be like, it can't be like a triangle or something like anything that's going to rotate. Um, so I'm like, all right, let me, let me, let me try this. I'll just put, you know, like a big dot on one or, um, or, or something. So the next iteration of this ended up being, so I had these two stones. One was obviously like very, very dark and I actually just like cut out pieces of construction paper and like made one like lighter than the other and like put a big dot in the middle. And it was like, all right, let me, let me, let me try this. Um, and this is sort of, we're getting closer to, we're, we're out of the NXG world. So, uh, you're welcome. Um, and, uh, you know, this is starting to get closer to the final application. So this is a, a real quick video of, of a collision um, um, of bet between two objects. And it tracked him. That wasn't a very exciting um, collision there. That was actually pretty weak. Um, um, but it was able to track the two objects. Um, and what I actually, what I did for, like, to give the user some feedback was um, I overlaid the region of interests back over the image so you had like that immediate feedback if it ever lost the object. Um, so um, this, you know, again, I was, I was encouraged by this, um, but, you know, I, I still, you know, would run into the issue of this isn't working every single time. Um, you know, I've, this class, it has about like 100 students in it. They're going to be running through this lab. They're going to be doing this. I can't have failures, you know. You know, I need a really, really high success rate. I need this to work almost every time. 
So I'm still having with issues reliably tracking the objects, you know, even though it just worked in the last video. Um, you know, I'm finding that I, I need the lighting to be perfect. If there's any sort of glare um, or any sort of foreign object, someone puts their hand in the frame or something, um, it, it can potentially throw it off. Um, and, and if I'm going to go this route where I'm going to use these, these identifier shapes, like I need to use ones that are, that are different enough in color and they have to be round so when they spin it doesn't change. Okay, so wait a minute, wait a minute. Color. There's, now there's, there's an idea. If I can just introduce some color into this, um, and it also took me like 10 minutes to get that animation to work properly. Um, anyway. Um, so once I decided, I was like, oh, this is so obvious. Like I'm, I'm sure most people kind of figured that out probably five slides ago, but, but younger Eric didn't, so sorry. Um, so once I decided to, to introduce some color into this, it, it sort of made everything a, a lot more reliable. So I decided to do a, a, a color pattern match instead of a, instead of a black and white. Um, and these are, these are all the same functions that are, that are in that machine vision, the one uh, sub um, subcategory I brought up earlier, the one palette I brought up earlier. And they function pretty much exactly the same as your black and white functions, except you know, there's color involved. Um, so what I would do is I would make the objects primary colors. Um, well, there already were primary colors, but you know, now I would take uh, video in, in color. Um, and these functions are, are nearly identical to the black and white versions. Um, so it would just be sort of simple replaces, find and replace um, in my VIs um, with a couple, you know, they would have a couple uh, different, different inputs I'd have to account for, but that was an easy fix. Um, so I went through and I, I replaced all of my black and white pattern uh, with the color, color patterns. So uh, I'm just going to quickly uh, demo the uh, final application here. So I'll go to uh, LabVIEW. So I'm going to actually first I'm going to pull up the, the video. Um, so what I have here is just a video of one of our um, data collection runs. So this is um, one of our lab, uh, one of our runs that we took in in lab. And uh, what the student's going to do is they're going to flick the uh, red stone into the, into the blue stone. And it's just a quick three second video. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll do that. So nice, exciting collision there. We even got, got a double collision. The blue rock uh, came, and hit the, uh, came and hit the yellow stone. Um, don't need you anymore. And I'll pull up my, my lab view application. Um, and kind of a fun thing, I put the um, Olympic theme music in this background. I don't think it's playing right now, but um, that was kind of fun. So, um, so I have my, my Calculate VI here, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up my uh, video file. So we'll go to Select. Let's navigate to my Data Run folder. I'll find my AVI file. Hit OK. Uh, it asks me if I'm ready to process the file. I am. Um, tells me in the next window I'll draw a box around the objects that I, I want to track. So I'll hit OK. So I have my uh, video here. I'm going to lower my mic so I can use the keyboard. And we don't need the yellow object here, but we'll track that one just for fun. So I'll hit OK, and then what it's going to start doing is it's going to start scrolling through each frame of this video um, and overlay the box around my object um, as, it, as it scrolls through the application. So we have a collision. Um, never mind the flashing overlays. That's fine. That's not a problem. Um, and we'll scroll through and should be done here in a moment. We'll save that as data run CSV. And over here on the right side, it just shows me the, the images that it learned. And uh, we'll go to my results tab and open up uh, the curling data, select the folder. Um, Uh, don't know what's going on there. 
evidently I hit a button in the wrong order. Um, if you want to, you know, if you want to stick around for my next presentation, and that's why you should put fail safes in there. So if you hit buttons in the wrong order, your application doesn't freeze up. Um, I will be doing that after the conference. Um, but yeah, but we got the we got the main tracking in there. I'll, I'll fight around with that later. I don't want to take too much time doing that. Um, Kurt slide. And now I have a blue screen. Oh, no, there we go. Um, cool. Uh, so, some, some lessons learned uh, through all of this. Um, the first one is obviously it's very easy to get overwhelmed facing a large obstacle. Um, if you feel that way, or if you know someone else who feels that way, encourage them to ask for help and say so. Um, you know, there's, there's no shame in sort of saying, this is a lot, I need some help. Um, and I think we should always be very open about saying that that's, that's okay. Um, for machine vision applications, uh, take care to have proper lighting and simple backgrounds and clear fields of view um, and use color if that helps. Um, you, you don't want to have anything in there that's, that's going to make your job any harder than it, than it already is. Um, and encourage taking small step towards your, towards your problem. Um, and what I really like to do is I like to play around with a feature. I'll just write sort of a simple throwaway VI um, and play around with something um, before I work it into the final product um, so I know kind of exactly what I need and I, I as, know as best I can the ins and outs of, of that function. Um, also be ready for your, for your unknown unknowns. Um, it's, you know, it's always so hard to predict everything that you think you're going to know. And as things pop up, you're, you're definitely going to, you know, have things that you didn't anticipate. Um, and celebrate the small victories. Even if it's just as simple as I hooked a camera up to LabVIEW and NIMAX saw it. Um, you know, celebrate the, the small things like that. You know, many times during this, like I would go to my coworkers and I would be like, oh, look, I, drew multiple boxes in this window and lab you can see it and they're all like great yeah um but i thought it was cool so celebrate the the, the small victories as well um and have a little bit of fun with with the things that you do um, a few acknowledgments, the people I just want to recognize, uh, Pat McGuire, uh, who, who could not make it, he wanted to come, uh, he designed and built the ice surface. Um, he is, you know, for the last seven and a half years, just been such a, a great friend and mentor to me. Um, uh, Dr. Zlip and Dr. Santian, they're the faculty members for this course who encourage this, you know, admittedly ridiculous idea of building an ice surface and buying a chiller just so we can do this teaching lab. Um, and then everyone in, the, in, in Sam's LabVIEW mastermind group, Sam, Casey, Enrique, Ravi, Stefan, and, and Kevin, um, they always do a really good job of just kind of creating a, a nice welcoming environment and make me feel like, feel like a part of the team. Um, and I, I appreciate that. And of course, uh, Team Schuster for their 2018 Olympic run, um, which was really the inspiration of, of why you know, we did this in the first place. Um, and the last thing is, so uh, in, in curling we have this thing where, you know, before and after, you know, at the end of the game, you know, all the, the teams all, all pump fists and they, and they say, they say good curling. Um, so now that we've reached the end of the presentation, I, I say to all of you, good curling. And if you have any questions, you can ask them now. That's it. <laughs> Um, question, have you gone back and tried the Express VIs? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> so the vision, vision processing Express VI uh, is the best Express VI in LabVIEW. Uh, the only good Express VI. <laughs> okay, Fab says DAC Assistant, but we're not going to stop there. Um, but I, I recommend doing that. There's also uh, a right-click convert Express VI that shows you all the low-level functions that it does too. So yeah. if anyone else is interested in that, like doing vision, I strongly recommend not taking the hard route. And as Fab mentioned earlier, this is like, like if you've seen Labyrinth the movie right at the beginning where she turns right and uh, later on in the movie, it's like you, you could have taken left. Uh, the Express VI was that left-hand turn because yeah. everything you've done there is is correct. but. 
Uh, I would have taken you a, a, a hundredth of the time with that Express VI. Did I, did I mention I'm also insane? Yeah. <laughs> well, no, that was evident. But, uh, great job. You didn't have to agree so quickly. <laughs> great, great job. I, this, is a, this is a great example of why I love LabVIEW. It is such a powerful tool that allows you to do things that are just, you know, uh, just great and uh, really powerful. So. Taking the left turn would make for a very boring movie. <laughs> True. Then I wouldn't get to be here today, so. Uh, early on when you were looking through the palettes, you had mentioned something about a camera calibrate VI. Yeah. Uh, and you said, hey, that looks interesting, but you never got back around to that. Did you do anything with that? Yeah, that's in there. I just, it wasn't part of the presentation. Um, yeah, I use that to calibrate uh, like the distances because when it just finds your matches, it finds it in like the pixel coordinates. And I just use that to go from the, you know, that into engineering units. Um, so that was originally part of, gonna be part of the presentation, but just for time's sake, I, I cut that out. Have you ever, or anybody here ever heard of Vision Builder? Yeah. I have not. That is even better than the Express. Okay. I'm going to disagree with that. <laughs> you can do all this experimentation without LabVIEW, and then you hit the button and say, convert to LabVIEW code. <laughs> so if anybody's interested in attacking Vision, I would highly suggest start with Vision Builder. Good to know. Uh, I would follow up on the the vision builder is pretty nice for if you want to it's it's me over here uh, it's pretty nice yeah. if you want to like uh, build that process and then like change your lighting and do something else like like change the circumstances of your stuff and see if that process continues to succeed okay cool did you find any issues using a cheaper camera versus a more industrial camera from a quality perspective or did you have to tweak the settings to keep the lighting and contrast consistent through the video? Um, we all, I only played around with um, the, the Logitech cameras. I did use one that was like 720 and then one was like 1080. Um, I, I found that the, the the 1080 one did work a little bit better just because it was you know like HD or something. Um, so I did notice a little bit of a difference in that. Um, I would assume that if I had a, you know, a three thousand dollar camera or something, that it would be even better. Um, no. It's all light. Yeah. yeah, it's all about the lighting contrast. Yeah, I agree. It's all about the light. So, was there an interest in processing in real time, or is it always post process? Um, I think that would be great if I can do it in real time. Um, I didn't really explore that, maybe like the next iteration. Um, one, of the, one of the things that I would like to do in like a next iteration would be to actually like teach it like an object once and then have it remember the object. And because like now I have to go through every video and like select the object every single time. That would be, that was the first step that I think that I would want to automate. Yep. Um, would be to able to do that. Um, which you, I know you can do. You can save those off the file and yeah. pull them back in. But then the issue comes in, you know, how fast can you process in real time with that camera at 30 frames per second, right? Yeah. That's the part that gets challenging. Yeah. Or is it going to be used as like a more of a predictive model? What did you do with the data? Um, so what we did with the data is, uh, so they got position versus time, and then we sort of passed that along to the students, and then they from that sort of figured out, you know, the, you know, got position versus time and then figured out velocities from that um, and then went and calculated things like, like momentum and coefficient to restitution and, and those sorts of things. Um, so we, we kind of got the data and passed it off to them and we're like, all right, you're a problem now. Um, <laughs> but um, that's, I guess that's, 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 that's one, of, one of our bad habits in the labs is, is we get the data and we're like, all right, you're a problem now. Um, cool. But, uh, yeah. Nice job. Thank you. So many questions. I don't know if that's good or bad. <laughs> hey, uh, just a, for future, if you're trying to do real time, mm -hmm. you have a red thing, a blue thing, and a yellow thing. That's all you need to know. You don't need to mess with pattern matches. Yep. Start looking at color thresholding and that, that little morphology 
kind of thing that you sort of mentioned, that might help you a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like, I don't know, maybe that was not the best way to do it. I don't know, but it was the way, that was kind of the first way that worked for me and I thought of, so, um, yeah. So there's applicability to, to the classroom, but I think this feels a little bit more of engineering for the fun of it, right? That's kind of a big part of that excitement that was engaged. Mm -hmm. Linking it back to the, the previous presentation mm -hmm. from LiveView Experiment, right? Mm -hmm. uh, did you find uh, throughout that process that people got more and more engaged with LabVIEW as a tool, or were there was, or were there instances of people saying this would be better, easier using some other uh, engaging um, uh, interface or, or language? Yeah, um, so for this particular example, um, like I kind of wrote all the software and then we had the students basically come in and just take their data and just run everything. So they didn't get too much involved into the, the programming side of things. Um, we wish they could, just kind of the scope of like the way the class is set up, like they're focused more on like the dynamics of that. Um, so we'd love to have the students do it. Um, I actually did have someone, um, actually when I, when I demoed it, um, like I, I demoed it, I was like, all right, so now we have this working thing. And he comes in and he's like, why didn't you, he's like, you know you could use Python for this. I'm like, it's done, like it's, I wrote it, it's done now. Like why are you asking me to use something else? Um, and I, I didn't verbally express all that loud. I was like, well, it, it worked, it's done, it works. Um, I used the tool that I used. Um, so do you have any other comments, sir? <laughs> <laughs> Not, not, I'm not saying sir as in you, sir. I'm saying the guy, just to clarify, just to clarify. Yeah, the, the, the person who hypothetically asked, the, 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 yeah, not, not you, I'm not calling you, yeah. <laughs> one, one second, drop the resolution. You don't, not only do you not need yeah. all that info, yeah. the processing gets yeah, way better. Yeah, yeah no, good, no, good Norm was suggesting drop the resolution so you can do image processing faster. He did not have a mic. All right, thanks very much, Eric. I think a lot of us have gone down that same path before we, before we're like, whoa, oh, there's an easier way. Um, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. congratulations, you've almost caught up. <laughs> a special thanks goes out to Kevin Chirey, Quentin Q. Aldridge, Mark Bala, and Jeff DeVore for their help in filming. And of course, this GDevCon NA 2023 wouldn't be possible without all of our sponsors. Thanks.